four sessions, and those four sessions uh, will be moderated by distinguished moderators, and uh, I will be your facilitator during this great Dasgupta review on economics of biodiversity, Africa consultation and presentation of this interim report. My name is Peter Odengo. I'm the head of Climate Finance and Green Economy Unit at the National Treasury and Planning in the Great Republic of Kenya. So, team, honorable colleagues, welcome. And uh, let me take this opportunity to call upon my able colleague, who has also been with us during all this time, Dr. Philip Osano, Acting Director, Stockholm Environment Institute, to uh, take the floor. Dr. Ari. Philips. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I I would like to welcome everyone to um, to this event. Um, we are starting the first session. The first session has two parts to it. The first part would be uh, a presentation by Professor Sat Das Gupta, um, who's going to be introduced to us shortly. Thereafter, we'll have um, reactions and responses from a panel of six distinguished experts that uh, we've lined up in order to help us really delve deep into the interim report. So without uh, wasting much time, I would first of all invite uh, Sandy Shard, uh, who is the Deputy Director and Head of the Economics of Biodiversity Review Team at Her Majesty's Treasury in the UK, um, to introduce Professor Sapatha Dasgupta, um, who will immediately um, start with his presentation. And thereafter, I'll come back and introduce the panelists and have request them to uh, start their interventions. So Sandy, over to you, please. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter, for the um, uh, introduction. Sorry, Philip, for the introduction. So um, thank you also to the Kenyan National Treasury and the Stockholm Environment Institute for convening today's discussion. It's a huge pleasure to be joining you all today to hear your perspectives on the topic of the economics of biodiversity. Last year, the UK Treasury, the UK's Economic and Finance Ministry, invited Professor Sapatha Dasgupta to undertake an independent and global review into this hugely important topic. The review is exploring the sustainability of our engagements with nature through an economic lens, what we take from it, how we transform what we take from it and return to it, why we've disrupted nature's processes and what we must do differently to enhance our collective wealth and well-being and that of our descendants. It strikes me that our discussion today cannot be more relevant. COVID-19 has brought into stark relief the economic and health consequences of environmental degradation and the need to do things differently. So it's a privilege and a pleasure uh, for my team and me to be supporting Professor Dasgupta with his work. Our team is based at the UK's Treasury. We comprise of analysts, scientists and policy officials from across government reflecting the complexity of issues the review is grappling with. And our interim report was published in April. This sets out the main economic and scientific concepts which will underpin the final report. And Professor Dasgupta will share his insights on these concepts shortly. As a global review, the professor and the team are keenly aware, aware of the importance of ensuring the review benefits from experiences and expertise from across the globe. So I strongly welcome and look forward to today's discussion, bringing together reactions and perspectives from across sub-Saharan Africa. Your insights today will inform our thinking ahead of publishing the final report in the autumn. I should stress the review is independent, so everything you hear from the professor or me today should not be taken to be the UK government's view. Of course, the government will want to respond to the review once we've published. So let me introduce Professor Dasgupta. He is the Frank Ramsey Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of both the British Academy and the Royal Society. In 2002, Professor Dasgupta was named Knight Bachelor by the Queen for Services to Economics, and he's the recipient of a plethora, plethora of prizes. 
His research interests have covered welfare and development economics, population, environmental and resource economics, the economics of undernutrition and the economics of social capital. So there really is no one more qualified to be undertaking this review. Let me now hand over to the professor to present some of the review's core scientific and economic concepts. And we very much want to encourage participants to submit questions throughout the event as you think of them. You can use the email address provided or the chat function um, in Zoom. So without further ado, let me hand over to you, Professor Desclipta. Okay. Right, I'm now unmuted. I have a voice. Well, thank you very much. Um, Sandy was right. I have been working on related themes, what I thought was the economics of biodiversity for about 40 years. So I thought I was reasonably well qualified to prepare this review. But pretty quickly, I realized it needed economics needed a serious overhaul. This is not somebody speaking from the left field or the right field. I'm smack in the middle of economics. So I'm not diverting from my commitment to the way our forefathers in my subject have taught us to think about society, social problems, no matter where. It's not that, it's that those of you, and many of you have economics background, will have recognized that the practice doesn't speak to the problems of biodiversity in general. And this certainly doesn't speak to the lives that are led, as far as I can tell, in rural sub-Saharan Africa. It wasn't meant to be. It's highly urban, it's highly high income country lensed subject. So over the months, in some deep sense, I've tried to even out that imbalance. And that has required a lot of work. It's not simply um, instructions to, for macroeconomic reasoning. Macroeconomic reasoning has to be embedded in our understanding of what households in even the poorest parts of our countries do how they think, how they react to circumstances, the stresses of life. And unless it does that, then it's all useless anyway. So we've had to, in many ways, recover economic analysis in our review to meet the problem of biodiversity globally as it appears locally. That's extremely important. The biosphere is an incredibly heterogeneous object, entity. What is experienced by a rural household in Malawi is very different from what is experienced by a rural household in Ohio, USA, not to mention an urban household in Nairobi and an urban household in LA. These differences means that the review is not finger wagging. It is not designed to tell people what they should do. It cannot do that. There's no way uh, any of us can do that, including people who are listening in at this workshop. Um, what instead it does is something I think far more important. It tells us how we should think about our relationship with the biosphere recognizing our relationship differs from person to person, circumstance to circumstance, location to location. So it's a really a grammar of thought rather than, a, or a, rather than a guide of instructions. One of the first things I realized, and that came very naturally to me because I'm a very committed, I suppose it's in my DNA, a Democrat, which is that unlike, for example, what you may expect in the economics of climate change, our, our, my review is not top-down instructions. 
I'm afraid even the Ministry of Finance in Kenya is a negligible object in the context of Kenyan society, as is the case in Indian. The Ministry of Finance in India is a small peg, minute peg, in the society that comprises India. That's extremely important. It's not only top, not top down exclusively. Of course, the government has a role, goes without saying. But we all think ourselves to be very important. And we must, first of all, get out of that thought. It's not even exclusively bottom up. The heterogeneity of the uh, biosphere means that information and knowledge and general empathy must flow sideways as well across villages, across towns and villages, laterally that is. So we have a institutional problem of massive importance to, to face, which is that a good institution, set of institutions must encourage information flow in all directions, up, down, down, up, sideways, and so on. Now, in a way, of course, most all societies are connected that way. It goes without saying, because we, we, we have evolved and needs have ensured that information does flow. The question is really the balance and how that information should be packaged. That's where, of course, the economics comes in. The second in realization I had was how much our subject is urban-based. We see the world through urban gaze, and yet biodiversity, for the most part, is in that large part of the Earth, which is not urban. I hesitate to say it's rural because so much of it, thank, thank God, even now is uninhabited. The forests, the wetlands. So, and yet, of course, we have an influence on what happens there. And the reason the economics of biodiversity is of the utmost importance is that we have really messed it up as a world community. Uh, and uh, this is not an issue of blame game. The review is not pointing fingers at anybody. But the data are absolutely overwhelming. Globally, we are making a, we have made a complete mess of our relationship with nature. So, okay, where do we go from here? First thing, first, each of the two points, three points that I'll be making now are each, one sentence each, but they have profound implications for redirecting economics, which is what the review tries to do. First is that unlike what you see in economic models, first of all, of course, most economic models don't have the environment, doesn't have the biosphere. We look at human capital and produce capital. Uh, the, the models that we work with in growth and development economics, mostly growth economics, doesn't have any biosphere in it. Um, the models that finance ministries have are built on the theoretical models. Don't forget that. And so if the theoretical models are faulty, then they filter down into the practical models that we use to uh, interpret, not just forecast, but interpret what we are forecasting. So the first one, first point is that we are humans, humanity is embedded in nature. We're not external to it. That sounds very flaky. Some would say mystical, but it has huge implications for the way we model. And I will come to it in question time, but this is not the point. This is not the place for technical details, but I just want to give you highlights. So we are embedded. And yet we are part of it, of course. And just as we like to think that we are assets. We say our children are assets. So, so are we. Our children think we are assets. Nature is an asset as well. So it has to be incorporated in our 
in our accounting system, if nothing else. It has value, and yet, of course, in the market, most often it doesn't have a value. And the review is a pains to try and unearth the variety of reasons why institutions have failed to adequately acknowledge the value of natural resources of nature. And when I say the value, of course, that's at the highest global level you're sort of aggregating around. We're talking about being sensitive to the value that is attached to the local ecosystem by your compatriots in rural Africa or rural India or rural China. Because of course the action, biodiversity's action is in the non-urban areas. Now we of course think it is the urban areas which are really at, in despair. Goes without saying, we hear about crowding, we think about shanty towns and so forth. All that is horrible, no question about it. But do bear in mind the urban bias in that picture. In order to alleviate that, the demands made on the biosphere surely emanates from the urban areas, even in Africa, not to mention India or China, that's for sure. But the impact is on the rural areas through the diffusion of nature's diffusion and the demands of products that we make for it. So when there are in the supply chain errors are committed in not giving weight to the value of those who are harnessing the primary products which are then sold, go to urban Africa, go to England, go to America and so forth we have serious misallocation. So nature is an asset and we have to find a way in which to value the asset and treat the problem of biodiversity, the economics of biodiversity as an asset management problem. Okay, now that sounds easy enough. You might say, well, environmental and resource economists have told us that they are assets. That's for sure. Remember, it's not that the review is trying to create new concepts at willy nilly. We're going to make use of the concept and turn it around, turn the economics around to be able to have a language, a grammar with which to see the, our relationship with the biosphere. The fourth point comes to the more macroeconomic reasoning that emanates from the emphasis I've given now up to now to, to the, uh, to the uh, biosphere, or the rural areas, if you like, the microcosm, which is that we have to change our, this asset management problem means that we need to measure economic success differently from the way it has been, current, or is currently done. The most common measure of economic success, and there are good reasons for it, I'm not going to go into it, although the review goes into it at great length, sympathetically, I should say, is GDP. Its weakness, GDP's weakness lies in the fact, for my purposes, never mind philosophical arguments, for our purposes here, its main weakness is that it doesn't include the depreciation of nature. It's gross domestic product, remember, not net. So you can have growth GDP rising even while you're eating into the biosphere. Worse, if you want to be technical about it, you can eat into the biosphere without anybody knowing, or at least put it this way, the economic statistics not recording, but it will be recorded as growth in total factor productivity. So you'll say, gosh, we're doing extremely well. We are so clever. We are becoming more efficient in using our resources because to factor, total factor productivity has been growing at 5%, let us say, just for the sake of argument. But it could be that that 5% is due to the fact that you are mining the earth system, not just fossil fuels, but your ecosystems, mining the forest and so forth. So we relate, the review relates microeconomic concerns at the village level, if you like, and the particularities of villages. And there's quite a number of chapters on norms of behavior as opposed to the law as a enforcing mechanism, as a guide to, to create the incentives for people to use 
resources to the macroeconomic. And that is, which is why the review is rather long. It has to create the thread which connects the single household to the macroeconomic model which is being observed by the decision makers in the planning commission or the ministry of finance and what we propose uh, and this is now beginning to be quite known because the united nations has taken this up in a big way particularly united nations environment program in nairobi uh, in a several reports three reports 2012 2014 and most recently the managi kumar report of 2018 is a concept of is a notion of inclusive wealth uh, inclusive because it includes natural capital the biosphere if when ideally done of course now remember theoretically all of this has to be tight absolutely tight so that there's no leakage anywhere and nobody can say there's inconsistency incongruity or anything once you have the theoretical structure well defined then you back off because it can't be done it can't be done because the data aren't there but quite apart from anything is valuation is a problem so we do we recommend what is natural to all of us which is we know what we want but we can't do it so we take shortcuts but the virtue of knowing what you want is that you know what shortcuts you're making without that you would be making ad hoc shortcuts and they could be inconsistent with one another and then suddenly you see outcomes which you were not only not expecting but are contrary to what you thought was going to happen that's terrible and that's been what's happening in our world because we've been using misusing economics using wrong ind indicators thinking that we're doing extremely well which we are in many ways we live longer we are better educated we eat better and so forth all that's there but we forget that we might be actually caving under by providing keeping a passing on a biosphere which is in worse shape less healthy state toward next generation okay so that's the setup there's extensive discussion in the uh, re review of why we are in a mess to give you a sense of that mess what we've done is to think of the biosphere as a regenerative resource an aggregate resource which is churning out goods and services many of which are silent many which, of which are invisible but we're still making use of them um, and what you see in front of you is what we called the impact inequality the unsustainable use of the biosphere on the right hand side is something that written as capital g as a function of capital s think of it as a forest and s is the stock capital g is the net production of forest services uh, it's bounded the economy is bounded the forest is bounded the biosphere is bounded so g cannot just be expected to grow like anything if you increase s in a pristine form g will be zero net output will be zero it'll be birth and death of organisms trees and so forth but of course we are far from there we are way up to the left where s is small we have reduced s g is small nevertheless on the left hand side is our demand so now you've got the language of economics demand and supply so we got this is all in flows so the left hand side is a flow annual demand let's say and the right hand side is annual supply and I want you to stretch your imagination and think of the entire biosphere as a great fishery or a great forest producing stuff that we then use for our purposes we being humanity on the left hand side is humanity's demand and we have broken up that demand into three components three factors n y and alpha the numerator n times y what do we observe what we can measure is the goods and services we have produced annually let's call that gdp we haven't got anything better so as an approximation let us suppose global gdp is the true value of, of the market value of our activities it measures our human activities okay alpha is the efficiency with which we transform nature's gift to us 
into those activities. Say pollination service, which we convert into agricultural output, which of course goes into the numerator. Total global demand is total by definition, it's total population. I'm looking at an aggregate figure here now. Total population times average demand, average per GDP, let's say. So we have three parameters to work with. And of course, the review goes deep into the engines of the relationship, the, the relationship between N, Y, and alpha. They're not independent of each other. If you perturb either any of them, you perturb the others. And yet, of course, you don't perturb them. You, we perturb something else much deeper. These are manifestation. These are epiphenomena, capital N, capital small y, and alpha. The real phenomena is the incentives we have, our motivations, what we like to do, and so forth. The pol public policies, and so forth. So I want to give you, a, in the next five minutes before I complete my I can conclude, I want you to give, give you a, a sense of these three parameters, starting with alpha. I won't give you any figures for alpha. What we have done is to try and tease out from macroeconomic data, as, as, it, as it's possible to get these days, to estimate how alpha has been changing over time. Alpha is, remember, the a, a parameter, an efficiency parameter. It measures, in some aggregate sense, the efficiency with which we transform goods and services that Mother Nature gives us into our final product. So the higher the alpha, the more efficient we are. So of course, the left-hand side, other things being equal, the higher the alpha, the left-hand side is reduced. Okay, And so therefore, you can see that that efficiency parameter may be one policy variable, policy type. And of course, in the economics of climate change, that's the only policy target that's been used. That is methods of reducing carbon uh, emissions. So moving from carbon intensive production technology for energy to non carbon based is what alpha, it rise of alpha means. In the economics of biodiversity, unfortunately, alpha is a puerile. In fact, if anything, technological change has been disastrous for the biosphere. Again, there are good reasons why it has been. It's been disastrous in, because, in, term, in a global sense uh, because entrepreneurs have absolutely no incentive to create in technologies which conserve or protect the biosphere. Remember, the biosphere is mostly free. Market failure, institutional failure. So if it's free, why would we wish to economize on it? Go for more. That might explain our, the enormous development in fishing, vessels in, you know, in, in, the, in, in the technology of fisheries, technology of removing forests uh, for clearing forests, which couldn't have been done 150 years ago even. So we have to look at N and Y. And I want first to look at Y, small y. And may I have the next slide, please? I've just done this yesterday with my colleague's help, Anne Perham, who is, I think, with us. I hope he is. Um, he's constructed this table for us. And here uh, you, you've used the uh, World Bank's classification of high income, upper middle, lower middle, and low income countries, their four way classification. On the first column of numbers, you've got GDP in purchasing par parity um, at 2017 prices, that was published 2019, in trillion dollars. High income countries in aggregate is 61.7 trillion uh, dollars PPP. And the share of global income in the high income countries is 47%. The percentage share of global population is 16%. So you, this is another way of expressing the inequality, the international inequality. Uh, across, across. But it does it, in my, in my judgment, in a, a way which speaks to the uh, economics of biodiversity. In contrast, if you look at low-income countries, that doesn't include the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. It includes a few in, in, uh, in some island countries and a few in South Asia, but uh, much of Sub-Saharan Africa is in that group, low-income. GDP per uh, PPP is 1.6 trillion, 
percentage share is 1%, share of global population is 9%. So you can see, I'm interested in this, highlighting this, because it is absolutely should be made transparent that Africa cannot be held remotely responsible for the mess we are in today. And the mess is, if I can have the first slide again, please. And the mess is in the inequality NY upon alpha as greater than G of S. Greater means demand exceeds supply, which means, of course, that S is being drawn down. And the more S gets drawn down, small g drops. Meanwhile, NY upon L, if alpha, if it increases, the gap between demand and supply increases. So you can see we are in really not, we are in a serious mess if we ignore the economics of biodiversity. Well, how big is this gap? By some estimates, these are all crude, by the way. These numbers are terribly crude, but you, you know, beggars can't be choosers because nobody has done this kind of exercise. I'm not at all embarrassed. My team is actually quite triumphant that this is crude, but it's damn sight better than zero. Is, is the, the one set of exercise says the ratio between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is about 1.7 now, which of course in colorful prose is described as we living on 1.7 Earths. You may have heard that expression where we need 1.7 Earths in order to be able to do what we are doing on a sustainable basis. Sustainability would mean, of course, that S remains at least constant, if not increasing. Declining S means we're not on a sustainable path. So we even have a, now a language in which to talk about sustainable development rather than in terms of sustainable development goals which were never screened for sustainability, by the way. If you look at the sustainable development goals, there's no mention as to whether it's actually, even if you realize them, whether they are sustainable. So first thing, as I say, this 1.7 let us, just for the sake of argument, this huge gap between demand and supply that we're now currently, and the gap is increasing, is not the responsibility. It's, they just, it's been due to the past behavior of today's rich countries and current behavior of emerging countries, the nations which want to lift themselves off. Okay, may I have the third? But unfortunately, the, the choices that Africa, if I may be allowed to use a heterogeneous, huge continent, subcontinent as one, which is a common practice, India is regarded as India, but it's got double digit languages, very different. I mean, it's, it's a natural thing to do if you do macroeconomics, but of course within it, you need to peer into it uh, and then see the heterogeneity and the stresses that societies face. The future looks not so good. In fact, the challenges that African societies face is what's forthcoming by the, when, uh, population divisions, um, they're the ones whose uh, numbers we all use, just as we use World Bank. Um, there are rival numbers, but they, have, they are tried and tested. Their current projection is that in 2100, which is their term, is that Sub-Saharan Africa's population will grow to nearly 3.8. Uh, 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 it'll grow. Uh, uh, it'll go to about 3.8 billion, which is almost 3 billion more than what it is today. That is going to cause challenges, as, as we like to say today, serious challenges. And it's not as though the point is really to look at the future. That's what we should be doing, not about today, but tomorrow, day after, and. These projections are made on assumptions regarding, obviously, many assumptions, hundreds of, of assumptions. It's been an ongoing projection they've been making for 40 years. Uh, the institution has been making 40 years. As you can see from 1950 to 2100, what an incredible difference it will be to the global population. It was about 2.5 billion in 1950. The global population, Africa, was a tiny bit of it. 2001, 
uh, 100, the mean, uh, the average projection is three point, uh, uh, 10.9 billion, uh, billion. We are at the moment 7.7 .7 billion, and then Sub-Saharan Africa has a large chunk here. We're looking at now, the, the reason I delved into this is of course to peer into the story of the household, the, the needs of women, since they bear the brunt burden of reproduction as to what their needs are and how whether their needs for family planning are being met. And of course, one of the sad things is, and it's all hangs together, is that I can't, is most countries don't take pl family planning seriously. And yet they, allegedly, they are very vociferous in acknowledging women's rights, that their needs need to be met, that they are in many, many situations, many societies, the, if you like, not the dominant decision makers, not just at the household, but stemming down from what are often male dominated decision making process. I'm not saying anything new here, but it's to me, these data, which I've now tried to put together in the review as a conceptual whole, where we don't talk about one thing, but talk about others. A kind of drawing room nicety. That's not correct. If we care about the world, if we care about the biosphere, and if we care about the most downtrodden person in our society, then we need to look at all the factors, the factors which you can identify as being potent in realizing the outcome that we observe. So the, the, the review takes family planning very seriously because it, I personally feel very strongly and I've always felt very strongly that women must be respected, taken on completely on a par with everybody else. We say one thing, we do another. That's the reason why I'm pointing this out. These are uh, problems that African society will face and uh, the leadership has to be has to come from, at one level, my thought is that it will come from government decision makers, and surely they should be. But as I've been composing the review, I've come increasingly to the opinion that even governments don't matter. What matters is the citizen. And it is when the citizen recognizes that the economic system that in which that he or she is placed, is working against her legitimate interests, then he or she, the citizen, will say, enough. Uh, we want to be heard. Uh, we want to protect our neighborhood, the animals around us, the plants around us. And we can't have suddenly people coming in and burning it or taking away. Now, this happens in some ways everywhere in other continents too, and we read about them. But that's the tone of the review. It is not pointing fingers at anybody. It's not telling anybody what to do. It's provide, trying to provide a grammar with which to understand ourselves, which includes, of course, our place in the biosphere. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Dasgupta. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you for that. Yeah, so thank you so much, Professor Dasgupta, for this uh, wonderful presentation about the uh, interim reports. Uh, as part of the program, we've actually asked uh, a panel of six distinguished experts from Africa, thought leaders, and we, we would like them to um, respond to some of the issues you've raised in your presentation, of course, uh, also making reference to the report, both in terms of the conceptual issues, but most importantly, um, also in terms of where do we go next? So the first, uh, I, I'm, my pleasure to introduce our first respondent, um, 
Dr. Julius Muya. Dr. Muya uh, is the Principal Secretary at the National Treasury in Kenya. Um, he has a PhD in finance. Uh, he has also quite a good experience, long-term experience in the private sector, both in the UK and Kenya. Um, and uh, I must say that um, I appreciate uh, Dr. Muya for also his leadership, because when I first introduced this idea to, to have an African consultation and invited the, the, the Kenya National Treasury, he, he, he was very open um, to, to this, this possibility, and that's why we're here today. So Dr. Muya, you do have uh, five minutes. Um, please, the floor is yours to uh, give your response uh, to Professor Dasgupta's um, presentation and the interim report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I sincerely do appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, share some words and some thoughts uh, in the next five minutes. First, actually listening to uh, Professor uh, Raz Gupta, I, I got the impression about systems theory, I mean, reminding my days in the university, about some of the relationships that sometimes we take for granted. And so I want to say thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for bringing that um, inclusivity in terms of how we are looking at the whole area of economics. Now, within the five minutes, let me just go very quickly and uh, say in, in, in Kenya, we have actually been looking at this area of um, uh, climate change, uh, which in a way you would say is a subset within the biodiversity that we are discussing and uh, the National Treasury, which is the ministry where I work, has actually been championing uh, areas uh, where we've been looking at um, inclusive green investment in the country, uh, where we have uh, focused on policy, structural issues, uh, looking at investment uh, innovations. And, and here is just looking at across the equal economy, the financial sector included, and also asking ourselves pertinent questions about um, uh, capital flows and uh, sustainable development and how all these things are linked together. Uh, but listening to Prof, uh, I can see a lot of threads that uh, can be useful in the many things that we have been doing in Kenya. Obviously, we've also been recognizing the fact that uh, when you look at uh, inclusive green investments, uh, you'd also have to address the issues of uh, the environment, which uh, Prof has talked a lot, a lot about. Uh, issues about uh, social and governance considerations. And, and again, um, asking ourselves the question about um, <clears throat> excuse me, how our green investment uh, plants uh, will support um, economic growth. Uh, but this is in the restrictive uh, area of uh, defining growth in terms of GDP. Uh, but still actually, still asking ourselves the question about uh, how clean, how resilient, and how sustainable is that growth. And so for us, uh, we have also been asking ourselves the pertinent questions about um, efficiency of use of resources, how to reduce pollution, and how to make sure that we mitigate uh, the environmental challenges that uh, we have in terms of damage to the environment. Obviously, uh, we've also been uh, grappling with the question about uh, investments, how when you are looking at investments, we tend to focus a lot of times from the investor lens. Uh, on the short term uh, without looking at the uh, broad interests of the society and especially, and uh, Prof has uh, articulated this very well, the low income segment of the population. So I see what Prof is suggesting uh, will help us actually be able to be more inclusive in the way we look at uh, investments. We are also clear about um, the benefits that uh, we can get uh, from um, inclusive investments. And uh, in this case, um, we were also cognizant of the fact that uh, Kenya being a low middle income economy, uh, we have um, uh, been depending a lot on uh, nature in terms of uh, nature being the source uh, of a lot of things that we do. And um, uh, looking at um, the analysis and the modeling that uh, has been uh, presented today, uh, there is um, a lot of thought that uh, we can also engage in, in looking at how we can uh, diversify and make sure that um, our economy is not uh, uh, too uh, dependent on um, uh, natural uh, resources uh, without uh, not taking into account whether we are reducing 
uh, the biodiversity as a result of growth. Obviously, our agriculture is, uh, is one area where we, we need to ask ourselves, how do we do our agriculture in this uh, area of um, whether we are regenerating uh, nature or uh, increasing the biodiversity uh, within uh, our environment. We've also been uh, deep doing a lot of things on the area of uh, climate change. And uh, Kenya, again, being in the, uh, the tropics, um, we, we have also been worried about um, issues about uh, lower crop uh, production, lower yields in terms of livestock, the question about forest fires, how do you account for them? How do you deal with the damage to fisheries as a result of our production processes and our distribution processes? And how do we uh, then account for reduction in hydropower generation uh, because of the climate change and uh, biodiversity related issues? Obviously, industrial production and the questions about uh, reduction in water supply because of the way we engage in our economics uh, and uh, development is an area that uh, we have also been um, uh, thinking about. But I like the question that uh, was presented uh, because it can help us put uh, some maths and some numbers into our worries. Now, some of the achievements quickly that I can share is that uh, we have been working very closely uh, with uh, other stakeholders as the State Department for the Treasury and Planning uh, to make sure that uh, we end up with uh, fairly cohesive and market-wide policies and regulations. And I can just mention a few here. Obviously, they are not as deep as uh, prof as um, developed, uh, but this is um, uh, because most of the um, uh, drive and initiative has been uh, informed by the climate change um, uh, undertakings in terms of uh, our national climate change and finance policies, our green economy and uh, strategic implementation plans. We've got um, a, our national determined um, contribution plans and uh, national climate action plans. There are a lot of things that institutional and um, regulatory and legal nature where Kenya has invested a lot. But I would think in order for us then to move forward in a fairly inclusive and comprehensive uh, framework using the frameworks that have been presented by a professor here. Uh, there's a lot that now we can do to amplify what we have been focusing on in terms of the uh, climate related issues. We are also been um, uh, looking at uh, green finance principles where we're involving the banking sector, we're looking at uh, uh, raising a green uh, bond, a sovereign bond later this year, and um, uh, looking to make sure that we address uh, the gaps that uh, could be there in terms of existing environmental and social regulation. So there's a whole retinue uh, of uh, things that uh, we can learn and uh, extract uh, from the presentation made by Prof uh, today. Now, my final comment is in terms of the challenges that uh, we have uh, seen within our uh, limited framework of looking at um, the climate change and related uh, nature issues. Uh, one of them, of course, is the, the question about uh, short-termness, uh, where success is measured in terms of financial uh, short-term uh, parameters. Uh, and, and a lot of times we tend to ignore the long-term economic value, uh, which uh, can be created uh, when you look at major stakeholders and you look at issues outside the, the finance parameter. Obviously, our institutional investors have been fairly uh, fragmented. And so I think looking the frame, uh, at the framework that the professor has presented is uh, a basis that uh, we can also see how we can structure and get them to work uh, in a more uh, organized way so that we can be able to bring up uh, uh, them up to scale. The, the other thing that, uh, of course, um, learning conti is continuous and um, we tend to see the question about um, our experience in this area is, is limited and uh, we are learning as we are running. And so um, our policies, our plans, our regulatory frameworks, they, they stand to benefit. Uh, from inputs uh, the like that we have had uh, from Professor. But one of the last things that I just want to say uh, from my 
um, education background, uh, looking at uh, the whole area of uh, risk return uh, frameworks as advanced by Harry Marco is a long, long way back. Um, the question about how economics is informing development and how we can bring in other parameters that are not uh, currently measured is quite exciting. And uh, I would say what Professor has presented uh, could be regarded as a, a groundbreaking uh, framework that uh, we'll um, participate in so that we can see how we can bring it up to scale and apply it uh, in, in the country and in the region. I complete my submission and uh, thank you for that opportunity to make my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muya. We really appreciate your sharing with us um, uh, the, the groundbreaking work that uh, you are doing um, at the National Treasury in Kenya. I'll, I'll quickly move over very fast to our second respondent, uh, Wanjira Mathai, is the Vice President uh, and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. She's also the Chair of the Wangari Mathai Foundation, of course, a foundation created in, in memory of our uh, late Mother Nobel Prize winner, uh, Wangari Mathai. So, uh, Wanjira, over to you, please, and uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muya. It's great to, to hear your interventions as well. Dr. Dasgupta, delighted to hear you and to read um, this report. Uh, I think one of the things that was exciting is uh, definitely the fact that you highlight that investing in nature actually results in a more positive result than was currently accounted for. And that obviously is because of how we mismanage uh, the world's natural capital today. There are obviously a number of different uh, economic opinions. I love your use of grammars of thought about the benefits of biodiversity. And this review is unique because it sees humanity as an integral part of the biosphere and not just being external. And then you mentioned dipping into the biosphere for goods and services. And I just love that graphic. I have not heard much opposition at all to people understanding the value of biodiversity. Actually, in your words, we recognize that biodiversity is essential, characteristic of nature, and we are playing an important role in its provision of ecosystem services to us. But where I get the sense that we are stuck and actually we don't quite believe or are willing to act is in the cost and risks associated with biodiversity loss. That's where I don't seem to perceive why we don't see that risk and act accordingly. After all, the, the Greta generation is incensed with the generations in charge because we don't seem to get it as far as they are concerned. The house is on fire and we just don't seem to understand. But I'm also personally challenged by our collective inertia around what we already know. Africa is faced with unacceptable levels of poverty, sluggish agricultural productivity. I read recently from the African Development Bank that we are 56%, our productivity in Africa is 56% below the global average, yet agriculture remains our largest employer and certainly our largest driver of economic prosperity and potentially could be even greater. We have a fast degrading and pressurized ecosystems and natural resources, the fastest urbanizing region in the world, and our youth population, the median age of Africans today, 19 years old, and in many countries, 70% of them under the age of 35. We've got to find a way to deliver hope and economic transformation to these young people and ensure that that transformation is real for them. And in many ways for us today, this is anchored in our long-term strategies, our NDCs, as Dr. Moya mentioned, but nature remains the single most important source in Africa through agriculture, food production. We know that that's where our solution lies. I love the Food and Land Use Coalition because it always reminds us that getting the food system right is central to a resilient recovery across the world. And it will create potential for millions of new jobs, less hunger, greater food security, better management of key resources, soil, water, forests, oceans. And I know Dr. Dasgupta that poverty in many ways, eliminating poverty is a huge driving force of this work. And so we have 
to think of this, that we have to be ambitious. And the, the truth of the matter is, for many of us in Africa, we do have ambitious development roadmaps across the continent. We must ensure, however, that those roadmaps are anchored on investment plans that also signal where we want to invest and that our investments are aligned to these ambitions for clean, clean resilient, uh, green futures. I look forward to the final report, certainly, and the actions that we must take to protect and enhance biodiversity and economic prosperity. But there are two areas where I think uh, some work is still needed. The first one is in the political economy. As a Kenyan on the panel, it is really nice to see Dr. Julius Moya and uh, uh, Peter Odengo on the panel because the truth of the matter is their experience in planning Vision 2030 and in envisioning the new climate economy across our country and the same in many countries where we work. I say this because they are the leaders and leaders like them who hold the key to a green, clean low carbon resilient future. And the truth is, if we do not anchor these in the planning processes and begin to understand the intrigues of our political economies, we will not get anywhere, even with the sort of knowledge we have. We've got to create champions who create and build even more political capital and understand just how these decisions are made at a granular level. So I, I think we need to essentially cement nature-based solutions and into our long-term strategies and send the right signals to investors that this is the direction that Africa wants to go. Until that happens, we will just be talking. So I'm delighted that my own country is doing that, but we need to be the champions that help make that happen. The second thing that I think is gonna be really important here is behavior change. The thing that COVID-19 underlines for all of us is that small changes in behavior, wearing a mask, washing our hands, they are significantly important in creating human safety. So modest changes that we make in our lifestyles as we reflect on what it means and the planet's fate will make a huge difference choosing an electric vehicle where possible, investing in mass transit, investing in inclusive infrastructure so that citizens have an option of not taking motorized transport and that they can walk or take non-motorized transport to move around, cutting household food and waste and multiple other behavior change um, transformations that need to happen. A lot of the transformation we are looking for requires mini transformation in our lives at different levels, and it is in all those levels. National governments to create that change in behavior amongst all of us. I'm inspired a lot by Andrew Ratti Roy's uh, recent statement in the Financial Times. She wrote that historically, Pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This is no different. It is a portal. It's a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to either walk through it dragging our carcasses of prejudice, our hatred, our data banks, our dead ideas, our dead rivers, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to reimagine this world and ready to fight for it. We know what needs to be done. So what's holding us back? We have got to get around at least these two barriers to unlock the possibility of this important work that we're talking about today. So I look forward to the final report, Dr. Dasgupta and your team, and thank you so much for sharing it and sharing it in the way that you did today. And also look forward to the actions that we must take to protect and enhance biodiversity and economic prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wanjira. Very great insight and input. And I like that you bring in the COVID-19 challenge. And I also like that you conclude poetically. I think it's also good for us to think about poetry uh, and, and just uh, that this is just not more modern science, but we, we, we can move from the equations and complicated technical words to sort of like literature and, and so on. Thank you so much, Wanjira. I move to our third uh, respondent, uh, Ms. Alice Rueza. Uh, the African Regional Director for WWF International. Uh, Ms. Rueza is actually an economist by training with over 30 years of experience in the multilateral development sector, having worked for 
Conservation International, UNDP, um, and is also a contributing author to the uh, Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which is one of the reports that Professor Dasgupta has referenced. So over to you, uh, Alice, uh, and uh, as usual, please uh, try to keep to five minutes. We appreciate uh, uh, your support on this. Uh, Alice. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Thank you, Professor Dasgupta, and to the panelists who have eloquently talked about the challenges uh, and the opportunities. Um, I too am very inspired by the report as an economist, of course, but also um, this uh, way, you, the imperative of forcing us to think about nature as an asset and to understand and explain the imbalance between humanity's needs and a model of economic prosperity that accounts for humanity's interaction and dependence of nature. Very valuable. I'm glad, uh, Professor, that you talk about women and family planning as a woman. I see, I see that education, women's education and, and family planning as a, a huge game changer in this continent. So I will start from where Wanjira left off, which is uh, why do we have this collective inertia? Uh, why we, we know what the problems are, but we are not acting on them. And it brings me to the point of the human agency. What is the human agency around this? Uh, when we talk about the value of nature, whose value is it? I think, Professor, you mentioned this very clearly. You said that you know there's a difference between the urban and also the rural. Whose value, when you, it, when you sit in the rural area and you look at the cost of living with wildlife, for example, what does that really mean? Does it now become an asset if, if with this particular wildlife kills my family? Is it still an asset? Um, the unequal distribution of wealth and benefits that are derived from, from nature, you know, local communities. Do we really capture the dynamic and nuanced nature of biodiversity, especially at a local level? And uh, the recognition, I think Professor talked about, the recognition of local communities as frontline custodians of our natural resources uh, and the costs and benefits of living with that. And also as agents of change, those champions that um, Wanjira talked about. So this report, even as much as it may be uh, looking at a global level, I believe we want to inspire these agents of change at a local level. And therefore, we would want this report to also speak to them in some way, uh, Professor. The second point for me is, uh, again, very much related to COVID-19. We talk about nature as an asset, but I also think it's important to position nature as a solution as a solution to everything we want to do going forward. How can we use nature as a launch pad to fixing our food systems that we need to fix, uh, fixing our health? I mean, a lot of the solutions to health come from our nature, our asset. How can we make biodiversity relevant to the people whose behavior we need to change? There is a reason why they, are, they continue to pollute. There's a reason why we continue doing the things that you talked about, Wanjira. I think it's because somehow we are missing, and that political economy uh, message you said fits there very well right there. The, right there. So we need to, to think about that behavior change, to, to, to engender the behavior change we will need to make this nature relevant to those people. I think you also capture very well in the report the systemic interdependencies, the um, uh, uh, PS also talked about these, that all the crises in silos at the same time, it's, it's, it's uh, health, it's economic, it's social, it's environmental, all of that is happening at the same time. So how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we look at health, but also look at food and look at the environment at the same time when we're in this system, this upheaval. So we need more robustness. And I, I think we will need, we will need this uh, report to help us think through this robustness. What are those choices that we can make that are flexible enough to take advantage of current opportunities, but also keep an eye on the future because we do need to keep an eye on the future. We'll need this multi-layered governance, whether it's going to be at the public level, at the local level, at the landscape level, and I like the fact that a lot of good new reports are coming out with this one health approach for us to look at, to look simultaneously at environmental health, at human health, and also at animal health, because I believe that that's an opportunity for us. This integrated approach is something we have not done well and something we need to think about. And 
the new social contract. This is something that's coming out a lot. Again, maybe related to the political economy, but the social contract is extremely important. Uh, the the COVID-19 has not caused, but exposed all the issues that we've had before. And the fact that we need to rebuild this social trust. The income inequality is very high. There's, there's, there's no denying the fact that this has been a problem for a while. And Professor, you talked about citizens. I think that citizen, there's this empowered self-organization and getting our citizens to stand up in arms and be involved in the, the solutions going forward is going to be important. And because of that, we will need to have this report be able to speak to everyone. Um, the, the way we communicate, uh, the, way we, the way we people, we help people internalize this message of, of nature as an asset will help create the ownership around the solutions that we are looking for. Um, not everybody will understand the alpha and all of that, but I'm sure there's a way we can make this speak to everyone because communication will be extremely important. And maybe the last point I want, to, I want to make is about the work that we ourselves are doing with the African Development Bank and a few others on the reimagining Africa's ecological futures. Looking at, it's, it's called the Africa Ecological Futures Assessment and really doing something similar to what you're doing is trying to see what will, what will that our ecological future look like and how, what should it look like and what decisions should we make now to start now to in, ensure that while we develop and while we, we, we pursue our ambitious uh, NDCs or ambitious economic plans, we still have our ecological future intact and this asset inter intact going forward. I look forward to this report. I look forward to continuing to engage uh, with the review. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Alice. A very thought-provoking um, response to Professor Dasgupta's report. Uh, we appreciate your input. I move over to our fourth um, respondent. Uh, Mr. Ruth Johnson is the Executive Secretary of the Secretariat for the Gaborone Declaration for sustainability in Africa. So, Rud, I leave it up to you to say what this declaration is about and what you're doing. Uh, I think speaking to some of the solutions that are being uh, being pointed out by uh, in Professor Dasgupta's uh, interim report. So, Rud, over to you, and you do have five minutes, please. So, uh, we look forward to your intervention. Thank you very much, um, Philip, and good day to all colleagues and, uh, and participants. Uh, Professor Dasgupta, thanks for your uh, report and your very eloquent uh, presentation. And thanks also to uh, my co-panelists for uh, indicating uh, a whole range of issues that uh, we certainly need to, to take into consideration here. I just want to concentrate on, on, on two issues. One, uh, I will talk a little bit about the uh, about the Haberona Declaration, but within the context of my point one, and which is really to um, link up with one of uh, Professor Dasgupta's sort of final points, where it's almost as if, you know, the ecosystem, the econo economic systems, rather, that we are, uh, that we're applying here, uh, seem to be sort of working against us and, and working against nature, and what can we do to make them work for us? I mean, we all know that GDP, in my own words, seems to be sort of measuring economic effort more than uh, well-being or dignity or of, of people, which, which I think we really need to think very carefully about here. Is it fit for purpose? What do we need to do? Is it the same system that has got us into this mess that we can use to provide the solutions? And I think it's more of a maybe slightly more theoretical or strategic discussion, but I think, you know, Professor Daskupta has given us, has, has teed it up, as it were, to, to have that discussion and make it more, more fundamental, because the way we're going at the moment with over-exploitation, unsustainable patterns of consumption and production, you know, we consistently take more out than we put back in. And uh, I think when we realize that uh, what we put back in is more in a form of waste than than investments to, to restore or to, to protect uh, nature, we started losing the plot and we, we need to do something to, uh, to make that work much better for us. And I'm, I'm glad uh, Alice and others have used uh, the, you know, natural-based solutions. Uh, they're, they're obviously there, we can, we can use those, we can use nature in a much better way. 
And uh, my point would be to, uh, to also see the, the value of biodiversity and nature and its uh, ecosystems, goods and services, and its natural resources. But really within the context of, of COP15 coming up, we really need to make a, a business case for, for nature. And that brings me to the GDSA. The Governor Declaration was signed in 2012, just a month before Rio plus 20. And as you know, Rio plus 20 sort of really addressed the, the, the economic side of sustainable development after the previous two really discussed more environment and, 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 and social issues. Um, so the 10 leaders at the time in, in, in 2012 uh, signed a declaration that is based on the premise that Africa has a lot of resources. It still has a lot of nature. We need that nature and the resources to develop uh, the opportunities and uh, economic growth for people on the African continent to get out of poverty, get higher levels of well-being. But at the same time, they realized that we don't really have a good understanding of the true value of all those resources that we that we are having and we feel very privileged to to have those resources in africa but do we deal with the right value do we use that value to inform our, our planning our policy our, our budgets etc so on the basis of that sort of premise um the the leaders at the time uh, and we are 16 now, by the way, we, we've moved from 10 to 16 over the last couple of, of years. And they argued that it was very important for us to do more work on natural capital accounting. Now, I think um, the, the review uh, by uh, the team led by uh, Professor Daskupta sort of makes, makes reference to it. But I think what we have found with working with several African countries is that in order to um, influence, say, policy making and making sure that the leaders and the champions, as we've been uh, discussing it, sort of really take note of nature as an asset and getting nature into your national system of accounts. You really need to talk the language of the people who are making those decisions. And those are our colleagues, economists and colleagues, environmentalists and colleagues, policy makers in the various uh, government institutions and the private sector as well. Let's, let's not forget the role of the private sector in this. But to talk that language, we felt very strongly that we should spend more time on uh, national capital accounting, which you, as you probably know, you can do at an ecosystem uh, level, but you can also do it for various topics, be it minerals, energy, water, forest, etc. And that's what the members of the Khabarona Declaration are, are, are doing. Uh, we facilitate that process as the, uh, as the Secretariat. And what we have noticed so far is that uh, with those efforts, it becomes very important to translate what comes out of the, those account, uh, accounting uh, activities, which could also be just you know, econ very simple, straightforward economic valuations, is to translate that into language that our, our policymakers and, 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 and colleagues understand and can use for better decision making. And as a last uh, point that I want to uh, mention here is that um, in order to facilitate that process, we've just recently, just last month, uh, started together with the World Bank and a number of the UN uh, agencies a um, community of practice on uh, national capital accounting where experts uh, can learn from one another. We anticipate exchanges, which we've already facilitated through the GDSA uh, amongst countries in, in the past. And to really just make the case that you can uh, use this information for a better dialogue with the, with the policy, uh, policy makers. And, and, and in that way, you know, we can really develop more of that political capital, I think, that, that some of us have already, have already mentioned. So really, um, that brings me to a, a very old saying that uh, has been with us for, for a while, which uh, I think the review sort of seems to support, is that we really need to think globally, but we need to act locally, locally being, you know, definition bound as in something that you can do at community level, personal level, but also regional and continental. 
to move to uh, to move this forward. So let's indeed uh, make sure that um, all what we're doing and the economic economic systems that we find ourselves in can be tweaked for for them to work for us and for nature. And um, as CI would say, people need nature to thrive. You know, nature can pretty well do without people, but we can't do it the other way around. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, wonderful. We look forward, of course, to working with you on scaling up the natural capital accounting across the African countries. Uh, my um, next uh, question is uh, Mr. Richard Ngatia. Uh, Mr. Ngatia is the president of the Kenya Nas National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, which is a premier business membership organization in Kenya that was established actually way back in 1965 and is present in all the 47 counties in Kenya. Uh, at the same time, he also uh, plays uh, an essential role as the chairman of the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region, which is a private sector forum uh, that champions peace, security, and stability in the Great Lakes uh, region of Africa. Uh, Mr. Ngatia, um, over to you. You bring in a very important perspective, which is the private sector, but not just the private sector, but I think they're focusing on the small and medium and micro enterprises, which is, of course, across the African landscape. We know that is quite a huge part of the private sector that is not usually represented in conversations like this, but has a huge impact on environment. So over to you, sir, and please, you have five minutes. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philip uh, Osano. I'm very grateful uh, that this afternoon, uh, this morning, uh, to be part of the panelists, and also a team that is to review the uh, Das Gupta uh, interim report. So I'm very grateful. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct uh, privilege and on behalf of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry to join you at this historic event to commit to our strategic partnership and collaboration in this endeavor. So we are happy to be part of the team to review and give our submission and comments on the role of the private sector in enabling green uh, uh, growth as well. So today, both governments and the private sector are increasingly aware of the convergence between sustainable development and market uh, priorities. So um, at the chamber, we have four pillars uh, that we operate under, which is policy advocacy, trade development, and SME development. Uh, and therefore, we are committed to sustainability and takes uh, the sustainable development goals as one of the guiding frameworks for policies of the chamber and the business operations uh, of its uh, members as well. So the majority of the members are micro, small and medium uh, enterprises as well. So currently we as a chamber are undertaking the Switch Africa Green, uh, that is the Green to Grow project by training SMEs on sustainable consumption production. Uh, we are also providing post-COVID support to the team to support recovery uh, efforts. And in its promotion of sustainable consumption and production, the EU-funded Switch Africa Green Program to address particularly the needs, roles, and potential of small, medium-sized uh, enterprises. So that are driving force uh, of economic growth, employment, trade, and innovation in Africa, while focusing on achieving uh, the following sustainable development goals, namely uh, number seven, which is the affordable and clean energy, number eight, uh, which is decent work and economic growth, uh, also looking at number 11, sustainable uh, cities and communities, and number 12, which is a responsible consumption and production, and uh, last but not least, the number 17, which is partnership for, uh, uh, for, for the goals. So I want to comment on Professor Gupta report and give our submission as uh, KNCCI. So as a business sector, we welcome the interim report of uh, the Gupta review because it highlights the need for engagement and promotion of technical support and financing of MSMEs to incorporate biodiversity protection and conversation practices in their operations to adapt practices that reduce the negative impacts of the businesses, products and services of biodiversity as well. So this will enable us to promote green enterprises that contribute towards building a green economy 
uh, serving the majority of the population, including um, smallholder farmers. So SMEs can contribute to green growth through eco innovation, eco adoption, eco entrepreneurship, which are termed as the three types of green uh, SMEs. So we as a chamber have played an important role in the past and we're still playing that role in the effort of transition uh, Kenya's economy to a green inclusive model and looks towards overcoming uh, some of the challenges such as lack of technology, low capacities and uh, financing gaps. So currently the organization is part of an important partnership composed of Kenyan and European institutions uh, we, uh, you know, who have uh, come together with the objective to promote sustainable green transformation in Kenya's agribusiness sector and as an umbrella body of all businesses, organizations, and associations in Kenya, the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry fully support embracing of the green economy to promote uh, sustainable consumption and production as part of the global environmental conservation efforts. So in the Green uh, to Grow project, an initiative financed by the European Union through the African Wide Switch Africa Green Program, KNCCI and its partners include the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, are supporting MSMEs to adapt green technologies and practices. This is to increase the competitiveness and agri-food sector while also reducing their environment, uh, uh, you know, environmental footprint. So less population, reduced waste and improved environmental condition on farm and along the value chains as well. Then currently, the chamber is also supporting the training of uh, SMEs uh, on sustainable production and consumption practices. And so far, over 100 SMEs that we have supported in three value chains as follows. Uh, this is a mango, uh, coffee, and dairy value chain sectors have been trained on business model canvas that enables them to reflect systematically on their sustainable uh, business growth. So we have supported a total of 15 counties and for the benefit of uh, those who may not know the geographic of uh, Kenya, we are devolved into 47 counties. One is uh, that uh, the counties that benefited were uh, Machakos, Makweni, Kirinyaga, Meru, Embu, Kiambu, Kilifi, there is Transoia, Moranga, Kisi, Kitui, Mombasa, Kericho, Nyeri, Nandi, Iwasingishu and Kajiadu counties. So those counties actually were the beneficiaries. So uh, we have contributed to the production of an important and truly innovative inventory on sustainable consumption and production practices in Kenya's mango coffee and dairy value chains, which contains a series of green and energy uh, efficient technologies and practices that vary from uh, uh, you know, traditional knowledge development through years of local experience to cost effective green technologies that are a result of an accumulation of uh, local international investment in research and development. So again, we as uh, KNCCI have also used our technical business expertise, and this is to provide technical assistance to dozens of agripreneurs on the fundamentals of green business modeling and cost uh, structures. So that's helping uh, to render the green transition effort uh, more sustainable. So through these efforts, we are contributing to building bioeconomy in Kenya in line with objectives of the Kenya Green uh, Strategy and Implementation Plan. This is 2016 to 2030. And this is what was alluded by uh, P.S. Julius Muya. And therefore, to achieve this implementation plan, we at KNCCI propose that we must be one col collaboration, uh, have a collaboration between all sectors of society, business and government. Two is policies that advance economic growth while enhancing environmental protection and social uh, progress. And that are consistent with international trade rules. And then provide access to finance, uh, promote technology transfer, strengthen capacity and reduces inequality. And the third is to promote social, environmental and economic innovation. Uh, a green economy uh, is one that is embedded in global markets and balance sheets. And therefore, uh, this drives innovation in private and public, uh, public finance. So again, the fourth one is to support balancing uh, short and long-term strategies. So a green economy needs to reconcile 
the need for short and medium-term pressure profits with long-term shared value. So uh, parties to continue also uh, adoption, uh, adaptation, and that is a coherence and operation of the legislative uh, framework, addressing green economy challenges as well, and then develop adequate economic and financial instruments to support the implementation of priority programs such as energy efficiency and the development of recycling and waste con uh, composition industries. And lastly is to ensure that the new industrial strategy integrates environmental requirements and participates in the growth of green industries, innovation and uh, regional development as well. So we as KCCI and the larger business community looks forward to the final report of the uh, Das Gupta uh, review and to acting to implement the recommendations arising uh, from the same. So we will continue to work with all the partners in research and in governments uh, to contribute to actions that lead to the achievement of the SDGs. So for me, in, con uh, in conclusion, uh, is building a green economy uh, that will not possible without, uh, you know, partnering uh, innovatively with the private sector, local communities, and the civil society. So such partnership should enable the mobilization of needed investments and technology solutions. So local skills development and intensify the commitment and solidarity uh, of uh, all uh, stakeholders uh, in the country. So eco-innovative uh, SMEs will be the real driving force of the green economy. So really, as a KNCCI, we are committed to work with all stakeholders and in uh, institutions to support the private sector agenda to adapt the green economy programs with a lot of focus to uh, the SMEs. So again, uh, panelists and participants, uh, Dr. Philip Osano, uh, Professor Dasgupta, uh, das thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the implementation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Gatia. We really appreciate your input. Very critical to look at the private sector. And we, of course, uh, looking forward to continue the conversation with you. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, uh, last but not least, um, it is now my singular pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Abebe Haile Gabriel. Uh, Dr. Abebe is the Assistant Director General and the Regional Representative for Africa for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Uh, uh, Dr. Bebe is trained in agricultural economics. He has a PhD in agricultural economics. Uh, he has previously actually been one of the leading um, thought leaders in Africa. Uh, he worked at the African Union Commission uh, for several years in different capacities, uh, concluding as the director of the um, Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture, where I had the pleasure to work with him for a year in developing the African Agricultural Strategy for 2015-2025. Dr. Bebe, over to you, and uh, please, uh, we are short on time, so I know you have a lot to share, but uh, kindly stick to five minutes. Thank you. Do, do we have Dr. Bebe online? Okay, yes, I was, uh, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, let me also thank uh, Professor Dasupta for an excellent presentation. Uh, as well as fellow panelists uh, for a very rich discussion. Of course, we welcome the uh, review and the interim report and appreciate the efforts towards consultation to seek inputs uh, on Africa-specific uh, contexts. The, the interim report sets out the clear objectives. It provides a good framework to identify key issues and actions actually at the ground at, the, at various levels. The reference to sense of urgency and doing business differently is appropriate, uh, all the more so taking into account the challenges brought about by the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is fundamentally altering economic and social realities. Now, viewing nature as an asset and biodiversity loss as an asset management problem is quite correct, but the question still remains on the adequacy of governance mechanisms and processes to manage such portfolio of assets at all levels with inbuilt systems of shared ownership and accountability. On the options for change, 
that can both enhance biodiversity and deliver economic prosperity, it might be necessary to identify possible trade-offs between these two aspirations, namely enhancing biodiversity and delivering prosperity, and how to account for, for, for these uh, trade-offs. The interim report asserts that over the years, economic prosperity has been achieved through processes that have been anathema to nature, quite rightly. Coming to the distributional dimensions, uh, the interim report rightly identifies that much, the, much of the biosphere remains open access resource. And this as a reason to the problem at hand. It could perhaps have gone a little deeper to analyze the differentiated roles of agency and processes, taking into account such as, for example, trade, both legal and illegal, to determine who has actually been exploiting nature and for what purpose, and who has actually been disproportionately paying the price for the negative consequences. For instance, IUU, the illegal unreported, uh, unregulated uh, fishing is a big problem along the African coast. FAO tried to introduce the, post state, uh, the port state measure agreements. Enforcement has been a challenge. The discussion on globally inefficient management of our portfolio of assets is quite revealing. The contrast between rates of return on produced capital vis-a-vis on planetary biomass rests on who owns the two strands of capital and who makes the investment decision or exploitation decision. Private capital rests on private or corporate ownership regime. Planetary capital faces, on the other hand, the open access resource dilemma. One could also argue that, after all, much of the biosphere is not equally open to all at no monetary charge. It's more open and disproportionately so to some powerful segments of the humanity at no monetary charge and at the expense of the more disadvantaged ones. The reference to humanity as has been uniformly mismanaging the global portfolio of assets may obscure the agency problem. Empowering the citizen is key, which the interim report identifies as the social evaluator. The role of the citizen and the relations of this citizen with public and private sectors have significant transition in the African context. The major concern is that this citizen is yet to empower herself sufficiently so as to influence the behavior and outcomes of the interactions with the private and public sectors. The emphasis that the interim report puts on social systems and institutions is appropriate towards correcting the structural imbalances and deficiencies in this regard. Such a differentiated approach would also apply at country and regional levels in the global political economic landscape. Now, some reflections on the options for change. Valuation, the first point. The true value of biodiversity contributions to human well-being is still underappreciated, particularly in decision-making processes and investments. Biodiversity is still an, an often taken for granted. The interim report recognizes this, but I think it needs to emphasize it further. Data is available to assess the status of our planet with respect to critical socioeconomic and environmental issues. For example, FAO makes a wealth of information freely available to users worldwide in its FAO stat. Methodologies are also available to enable valuation of all aspects of agricultural services within the national GDP. Uh, for example, in collaboration with UN Sustainable Development and the UN Statistical Commission, FAO has developed and published this year the system of economic environmental accounts for agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. On policy, the importance of avoiding the risk of perverse incentives is important. The report says uh, clearly that growth did happen at the expense of nature. The benefits were not shared equitably. It will be necessary to determine who was mainly responsible for impact inequality. The interim report identifies demographic trends, population growth, N, capital N for this, which is large and growing fast in developing countries, most notably in Africa. On the other hand, it correctly identified, and I'm very happy that Professor Das Gufta has underlined this, that Sub-Saharan Africa 
which represents only 3% of the world economy, cannot remotely be held responsible for the global environmental problems we face today. How about a fairer global order to deal with inequalities in the real estate? The question still remains as to whether economic incentives, mainly through correcting price distortions, namely the divergence between the market prices and accounting prices, could redress the structural anomalies in wealth distribution, both within national and international dimensions. Perhaps we can borrow a leaf from the climate change narratives, the principle of shared but dis differentiated responsibilities and capacities. And finally, step on stepping up advocacy and capacity strengthening. In 2019, FAO convened a series of regional dialogues on mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors, including one for Africa that was held in Kigali, Rwanda in November 2019. A list of recommendations were made covering areas ranging from awareness raising and knowledge sharing to research and development and from building alliances to strengthening capacities and systems among others. Uh, in the interest of time, let me stop here. I uh, very much look forward to receiving the final report. Once again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Dasgupta, for and your team for the leadership. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bebe. Uh, we appreciate your input, uh, and we look forward, of course, to continuing the engagement with you. Uh, it's now uh, the point where we have to move to the next session. Um, uh, and just uh, just before moving to the next session, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, who is going to moderate this session. Uh, Mr. Joe Ageo is a, a well-known journalist uh, uh, from Africa, also with a background in environment. And he will take us through the next session, which is a, a very exciting because we'll get to start answering some of your questions. So Joe, over to you, please. All right, thank you very much, Philip, uh, for that very illuminating session. I, uh, I think it is, it is fair to say that uh, uh, we have uh, clearly accounted for a lot of things. I've heard about natural capital, natural capital accounting, and I think it is only fair to start with the natural question that emerges out of these things, uh, which is uh, to Professor Dasgupta, that uh, this uh, review is one among many things that have happened, many reports that we have seen. How would you say this is fundamentally different from the other reports we've seen about the economic uh, value of, of biodiversity? For example, uh, the report that has been referenced here many times, uh, the uh, e economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, for example, either in terms of the methodology or even in terms of the findings. Well, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, I think the easiest way for me to address your question is to remind us of what we heard from the previous six speakers, which were amazingly rich um, set of observations, and which absolutely without, this would suggest that decentralization works. I have not, do not know any of the six speakers. But they, their observations were completely in tune with the review. And so, yes, that in some sense is the right answer to your question, because you have not seen any uh, of the previous writings, an overarching narrative of the way we need to think about the economics of our diversity or our, if you like, our daily lives. Environmental and resourcing, there are two classes of studies. One is, of, is the um, state of the environment reports. For example, uh, MA, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or the more recent IPBS report. They're telling you about what the world is like. Ours is not a state of the environment report. We borrow from their findings, but their findings themselves were based on serious scientific work by colleagues in the environmental sciences and in ecology. And I have borrowed actually directly from the original sources rather than rely on IPBS or Millennium Ecosystem Assessment because 
as you know from translation, translation um, often creates errors. It's best to go to the original sources. So most of our references in the, ref in the early chapters of the review where we study the science of nature um, are based on original work. Um, so that's one class. The other class, environmental resource economics, essentially is concerned with valuation. And uh, I, if you don't mind, uh, Chairman, I'd like to speak a little bit to it. Um, it saw so, so it was that literature which is extremely rich. No question about it. Enormously interesting techniques were developed on valuation, which say can, um, CPM, travel cost methods, and so forth. They were in many ways motivated by the demands of the world's rich people. They were concerned with the amenities. And if I may say so, only 20 years ago, I used to be told by members of the Planning Commission in India, well, where is the, where is the money in all this? Uh, this is rich countries' problems. They want to have clean beaches. Our poor people can't go to even beaches, let alone clean beaches. So if you look at nature as a luxury good, you get much of the flavor of environmental and resource economics. My review is, doesn't take that position at all. It takes nature services as deeply ingrained in us. We are nature services. We're the product of nature services. So the question of luxury doesn't arise at all. We're looking at an interrelated system. Um, and each of the, many of the three, all the six speakers raised matters and pointed to issues which are deeply uh, studied in the, in the review. Let me just give you two quick examples and then I'll, you can ask, field some further questions. Dr. Mathai asked a very, very good question. Uh, if we know this, why isn't anything being done? And I can give you an example of my, from my own experience, which is nature is highly interconnected. Now that seems an absolutely trite observation, but it does mean that if you bring natural nature's project, green projects, let's call it, okay, green projects, singly, a wetland here or a garden there or a bit of uh, forest here, and present it and say, we want to preserve it, or we want to invest with the government ought to invest money to preserve it. Typically, the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Finance will override it because there is more money in something else, extending the road system, for example. Money being now social good money because it's going to bring trade possibilities open. But because nature is interconnected, the projects, nature-based solution projects, are complementary to one another. So you really can't ever win if you come with small projects against produced capital, projects which are involving the production of produced capital. You need to think integratedly. We haven't done that. We haven't been encouraged to do that. And we haven't been encouraged to do that because we take ourselves to be external to nature. That's, that's where the real rub is. So to Dr. Bathai, she asked exactly the right question. And I think we do have an answer, which is you bring small projects bit by bit, green projects, and they will lose. Unless the decision maker happens to have some particular fondness for a particular species of trees or animals or something. But you don't want to rely on that. So that's one thing. The other is that the review really goes deep into um, the, the, the relationship between poverty, real deep poverty and environmental pr protection, that is biodiversity protection. And which is why in my summary of our review, the introductory remarks, I pointed to the fact that we really have to look at the economics of biodiversity, at least when I say, uh, at least at the global level, by hitching it onto the economics of poverty. Because it's the poor who reside in biodiverse, rich parts of the world. I mean, that's when I say literally in, this, 
on the scene, on the locale. And I don't want to belabor it, and I have to be ginger about it because I need to produce the evidence in a way uh, that's persuasive. But broadly speaking, we're looking at an urban, rural, face-to-face -face confrontation. The demands are made of the urban area because they are richer. Decision makers are there. They are ingrained in it. And this is true throughout the world. Of course, in some countries, rural populations can be very powerful, rich farmers, for example. But we're looking at now, we're talking now in terms of Africa, and we are looking at small households spread out over the continent, um, which is the link that we draw in the review between poverty and biodiversity at the extreme level now, means that the demand is being fashioned elsewhere and it's impinging on the local community. And so we should not be surprised that the cure for uh, poverty that we've seen in, over the past 30 years in the international sphere has really effectively asked the way to do that is to remove people from their sources and make them richer elsewhere. Okay? Give employment to opportunities in cities and so forth. Now you can see why in a way it multiplies the pressure on biodiversity because who's speaking for nature when there aren't people there? You can go and exploit it. So that link is something we are, we've done in the context of common property resources, the micro level. Unfortunately, most of my examples are really from the Indian subcontinent because the Indian subcontinent has produced economists who have actually spent time doing field work there. There is quite a bit in, in Africa as well, but not quite as rich a literature that there is in, in South Asia. But anyway, we, I can at best give you instances, each country, each region has to find its own solutions, and the, which is why we are offering a grammar, not the solution. The solution has to come internally from the sources. Um, the finally, the second, uh, uh, third question, which I'll, give, I'll, give, uh, I'll speak to because that also speaks to your thing. Several members have talked about the business case for nature. And one of the things that the, this grammar tells us is that there is no platonic notion of what the business case is. The business case is what we make of the business case. When I say we, I mean our institutions. The, much of the biosphere is free. So of course, the business person's case will be, why would I wish to invest in something which is, has very low return? Well, society can make that thing which has now a low rate of return have very high rate of return by actually changing what is allowed and what's not allowed. So institutional reform really is something which redirects the motivations of individuals and groups. And the review sees that. So there is no absolute notion of the business interest. Business interest can be transformed tomorrow by complete by change of the legal system, by the norms that we choose to follow. Disapproval of certain types of activities will then become translated into altered set of business in interests, provided there is sufficient pressure from this disapproval, social disapproval. People stop buying stuff from it, from a fir firm which is misbehaving. We do not spend much time, although there is an entire annex on corruption and illegal trade in charismatic uh, 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 organisms. We do have an annex, but it's a, in some sense a giveaway because we are, it's very easy. If something is illegal is bad, okay. Unless the law is bad, of course. But assuming the law is good, something which is illegal is bad. You don't have to write a review to explain that. The real trick is to see why things are bad, even though they're legal. We need to change the law. We need to change the norms. And we have a lot in that. So these three examples uh, are which I would give to as an illustration of how the review is entirely different from what you've been reading. Oh, well, th th thank you very much for that, because I think uh, what you touched on uh, at the end there, uh, it partly addresses the question of 
uh, what, what has been called distributional equity. If you think about where uh, the, the, the biodiversity value is appropriated and where in fact, for example, uh, it, is, it is produced. So, so there is that, uh, that imbalance that, that, that is there. But I think I want to tie this down with the point that Alice raised a little bit earlier and I'll go to the other panelists in a moment. But Professor uh, Alice raised the point of this whole question of nature being an asset and therefore how the new, that translates uh, in communities, for example, where there is human wildlife conflict, where people see an elephant and they actually see uh, a danger to their next crop season. So, so where is that uh, uh, perspective that captures that seeming contradiction, where whereas it might be an asset for some people to exploit, but in another part, in another context, it is actually a problem. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ov overlooked that question. These are, I could just, I keep on repeating, but these four, these six sets of observations were absolutely terrific. I thought I was really, not only are they good, but it sort of self serves my purpose because they're very much in line with uh, the, the drift on my review. This question is extremely good, but because it has wider ramifications. Instead of, it, we can look at the very local problem of the elephant and the villages. Who, who lived there and is a danger. It could be, you can even talk about this lion who comes and uh, destroys the cattle or whatever. So there are plenty of examples of that sort. But now take the, move to another continent and look at the burning of the Amazon that is currently happening. We read about it every day. How many, how many Belgians are being burned by each decade in, in the Amazon, the size of Belgium, as it were. These kinds of statistics, which are very valuable. The government, let us say the government says, in this case, the farmer says, or the, the inhabitant says, the elephant is a nuisance and is harming our livelihood. In the other case, in the macroeconomics case, the government is claiming that it's extremely important for their development and employment opportunities. So it's our property. Who are you to say anything? You look at the latter case, the Brazilian case. Standard economics will tell us that if it is a public good, it's a global public good, the forest, the Amazon forest, then we all ought to be contributing to its preservation. It's, that's how it is. It's a public, public good. Public goods, people pay for it if they're enjoying some benefit. Likewise, in the case of elephant, to protect the elephant, they, the villagers need to be, to, to, be, uh, to, to be compensated for the danger. Maybe the, some attention has to be given to helping them move, the people move, because it's harder for elephants to find a new terrain. But what I'm saying is that institutional, institutional design must take into account the competing demands. The whole of life is full of it, that I need something, somebody else needs something, and there's some mediation possibilities. Typically, we think government regulations, market system mediates these conflicting demands. Here, we have a serious problem because there are no markets, which is the reason why uh, you've asked the question, uh, Alice asked the question. Um, but again, for each such example, we need to find a way to compensate the parties to be able to avoid the issue. And in the Brazilian case, surely it's, it's the time that the international uh, community got together to say, how can we help a nation which feels there are private returns to be had, national returns to be had from a global public good to protect it. All right, thank you very much, Professor. I want to expand this a little bit to the other panelists. Obviously, we have um, very little time, but we'll try and make the best use of it. And I'll come to you, Alice, because uh, uh, you've been mentioned quite a bit here. But I want to tie uh, my question to you with uh, what one of uh, our, our, our a participant here has, has, has brought us a question to our chat platform, which, by the way, you can continue using to, to send your comments and questions. And this is uh, Linus Mofo, and, and he says, Professor Dasgupta has made a great point about Africa's very limited role in contributing to today's mess. In the spirit of environmental and climate justice, he asks, how should this be accounted for in assessing how we use the remaining commons and having Africa's share, use, and right development and equity. 
So Alice, I want to hear your response to that. And I will, of course, I'll come back to Professor Dasgupta a, a little later. I want to start with Alice and then probably the rest of the panelists to see what perspectives we can get. Alice. Thank you for the question. Um, interesting question. I, I, um, I was just reading today uh, in, uh, um, in uh, DevEx that the incoming um, head of the Global Environment Facility has suggested that they, we put a value, a global GDP for nature, a percent of GDP towards nature. And he's suggesting 1%. I haven't calculated how much that is, but I think my answer to you is if Africa has not contributed to this mess, then we maybe, maybe, we should, someone should compensate us for, uh, for not contributing to this mess. <laughs> and I don't know how much of that 1% GDP we should get. Um, I, that is, that is a, a, a simple answer I could give you in terms of how do we account for that. But I think another thing the professor talked about, which also concerned me and I, I, I will challenge the rest of us is the, he mentioned that he uses, he uses a lot of examples from Asia and India and because there's a lot of work done in that, in that area. And I thought, well, even in Africa, we should do a lot more work on bringing out the, the various examples that we have um, on the value of nature and nature as an asset and, and all of those interconnections. So, um, Joe, I don't have a straightforward answer, but I think I'll pass it on to the other panelists to talk about the justice and, and all of that. But I think for me, it is it, it, the form of compensation could be one way of looking at that. If the value is elsewhere and the cost is here, then there must be some level of compensation. But also we should produce a lot more um, literature and contribute to this, uh, uh, the, the report coming up to really bring out the African experience and the, and the, and the, and the African agency. Over. All right, Th thank you. Maybe we could go to Wanjira Madai. And, and just hear your thoughts on this question of, of, uh, of, of justice uh, relative to Africa's uh, differentiated responsibility as it were. Uh, I think um, dropped off the call. Yeah. Joe, I think Wanjira has dropped off the call. Oh, 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 I'm sorry about that. Okay, then we could get um, uh, Ruth. I don't know uh, if you could uh, jump in and, and save the day here. Ruth Johnson. Hi, thanks, um, uh, Joe. And um, you know, definitely uh, support that, uh, that, that thinking and, and the question. Um, just to give you an example of how it works with the with the GDSA and the man and what I mentioned before was you know we, we need to start talking uh, the, the language of the people who uh, sort of make the decisions and 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 get that point uh, across and if we if we need to make a better case of how we can make use of you know the the resources that are still still with us um, I, I have a sort of generic example of uh, how, uh, call it country A, would be uh, chopping down uh, almost an entire uh, forest area and, and, and sold it, uh, in the individual trees, as it were, sold, sold the timber. And when it was pointed out that the total uh, value of the forest was infinitely bigger than the value of, say, 10,000 individual trees, uh, people really twigged and, and could see that, you know, once we start putting the real economic value of it, and this is not to monetize, monetize it, this is not money in the bank. This is economic value that allows you to make better decisions and plan better and, and, and develop better policies. And I think that's the way to go. I think one of the ways to go in Africa is to have a better appreciation of what it, what it is that we have and where we feel we have to sell, where we feel there are trade-offs and everybody who is uh, you know, aware of what sustainable development means in practice is, is aware that we can't always have our cake and eat it, as it were, um, but, but make sure that there are, there are trade-offs, that we, we are fully aware of what we are trading off at which value and make the best decision with the information available. 
So really, it, it boils down to me, uh, and this is where I want to, to end, is, um, you know, let's, let's be more appreciative of the, of the real value of what we have so we can really make better decisions. And in addition to the justice issue and how much of that is, is rural versus urban, and, and I take Prof's uh, you know, observations on that, and, and Alice's uh, issue on, on, on compensation, yeah, uh, eco justice is an issue. It it is particularly relevant to to Africa, but let's let's uh, arm ourselves with the right um, information and arguments to to make that case at at the global level and for ourselves in Africa. Thank you. All, all right, all right. Thank you, Doctor Abebe Hel Gabriel. Um, you you kind of referred to this a little bit towards the end of your presentation, but I would like you to tie this in with a question that comes from uh, Diaz Chavez, Rocio Diaz Chavez, and, and, and he says, there have been proposals for alternative indicators to GDP that actually show the well-being of people. Then he's asking, which could be the indicators to consider instead of GDP that shows uh, all these synergies that we're talking about uh, with regard to biodiversity conservation, uh, I, I don't know where where you stand on this. Just hold on, just hold on. Uh, okay. Thank I can you. see you have been you have been given a voice now. You can speak. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not easy when your voice is controlled from uh, a remote. <laughs> uh, I guess makes you understand the concept of the voiceless in society. <laughs> okay. Uh, to say that uh, uh, Africa was, um, was not uh, responsible for the mess is not uh, the same thing as saying, we can be responsible for what is going to happen going forward. Okay, so um, are we going to follow the same kind of trajectory in the, uh, in the way we transform our uh, economies? Or are we uh, going to take important lessons from uh, those practices which have been harmful to nature and so on? I think this is very important. What I see is a dis disjunction uh, or a kind of uh, delinking of the, the arguments at the policy level between those who uh, are responsible for economic growth, economic transformation, and those who are responsible for uh, environment, natural resources, and so on. Um, issues such as nature-based solutions, restorations, and so on, these are very uh, current in, in some quarters, but I'm not sure if they have gone, uh, they, they have found their ways into those who make decisions uh, on, on economic growth and so on. At the country level, start, I'm, I'm talking about country level. So getting the narratives and the arguments right and sharing, co-sharing uh, uh, multi-sectorally, I think, this will help uh, quite a lot. Now, at the end of the day, um, the results, the, 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 the results that we're going to, the outcomes that we're going to get depends on who is going to do what at the, uh, the individual level, so-called citizens, at the community level, and so on. So that is where real actions are taking place. And the example that was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the, the conflicts between what happens at the local level, the use of the, 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 the elephant, uh, and at the macro eco economic level. How would the, that unit at that level, be it individual or communities, and in the African sense, communities make a lot of sense, uh, how do they see that? How do they, but see, but they perceive, perceive it? Do they perceive it as owning it fully? Or do they perceive it as something that is owned by something outside of their control? I think that is 
where we need to really emphasize the issue of empowering the citizen and the communities and also strengthening the institutions uh, and, and capacities, I think it is very, uh, very important. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the indicator, yeah, okay, over to you. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Hela Gabriel. I, I am uh, afraid that uh, our time has really gone and we need to move to the next uh, uh, segment. Please remember that this conversation is still going on online. The, on Twitter, the hashtags that uh, we're using is Das Gupta Review. Um, the other one is economics of biodiversity and the other one is hashtag biodiversity. So please keep this conversation going, even as we move over to, to the next session uh, and I want to, to hand this back to, to Philip. Thank, thank you so much, Joe. Um, thank you for moderating this session. We, we appreciate and as Joe said, we will get back to all the questions that have been uh, submitted to us. I would like to invite uh, Sandy Shad, who is the Deputy Director and Head of the Economics of Biodiversity Review Team at Her Majesty's Treasury in the UK to take us through the ministerial segment. So, Sandy, over to you, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, as you mentioned, this is uh, the ministerial segment now. We're very uh, delighted, very fortunate to have with us today um, Honourable uh, Francis Gattare, CEO and Cabinet Secretary of the Rwanda Mines Petroleum and Gas Board. Honourable Kemi Badenoch, um, the Exec Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. And I believe we're also expecting Honourable Ambassador Uko Yatani, Cabinet Secretary from the Kenya National Treasury. Um, so uh, fantastic um, uh, showing of of support for, for these issues. Um, I believe we're waiting on um, uh, Ambassador Yatani. So if I could start with Honourable Francis um, Gattare, we're delighted to have you join us today. Rwanda, Rwanda is of course very alive uh, to the importance of natural capital and has shown considerable leadership in the region on natural capital accounting, including as an early member of the World Bank's WAVES programme. So we're very keen to hear your perspectives today. If I could uh, hand over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me and uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Das Gupta and the team who are working on the report and uh, for a fantastic presentation today. I uh, hope you can hear me, is that correct? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. I uh, also want to thank the uh, UK government uh, who have uh, sponsored this study, as well as the Kenyan government who have hosted us uh, today for, for this event. Uh, thank you all uh, who have uh, made presentations that have uh, enriched the uh, discussions. Uh, for me, uh, it's a, an easy presentation I'm going to make following a very rich presentation that uh, experts have done. Uh, because the report uh, that uh, Professor De, uh, that Gupta has presented and uh, worked on for some time has made a very strong and compelling case about uh, biodiversity at the center of many economic activities, particularly in Africa. Uh, these activities, of course, have got a very far reaching impact to the livelihoods uh, of many, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in fisheries, uh, natural resources, and uh, other things. But to many, sometimes it's uh, a matter of uh, life and death because uh, they derive their day-to-day -day survival on, uh, on biodiversity. Uh, there is therefore a very uh, important role for leadership uh, to make sure that there is uh, always going to be coherence, whether it's in strategy and policy uh, at the global level, at the regional level, and at the national level, because the impact of uh, uh, the effects of uh, the degradation of biodiversity often is more severe to the local communities. I, want to speak more uh, regionally uh, on Africa, which is uh, highly uh, endowed with uh, immense uh, resources of uh, biodiversity, but unfortunately, which continues also to witness the degradation of this uh, biodiversity as a result of the conflict that continues to manifest itself 
uh, between human livelihoods and their uh, conservation efforts for the, uh, for the biodiversity. And uh, therefore, it's uh, very important that any activities that we uh, put in place for the conservation of this uh, biodiversity is seen in, in that lens, whether it's at the global level, regional level, or uh, at the local level. In Rwanda, we have witnessed that even though it's very convenient for uh, people to see the global effects of the exploitation and degradation of biodiversity globally and, and look at the low levels of the contribution of the African continent and say that, well, it's our turn, we must uh, focus on development uh, and, and not so much on conservation. But we realize that when the negative effect of the continued degradation of biodiversity happens, its uh, effects uh, get felt more locally than globally. And so it's very important that as a government, we take leadership to put in place measures that are going to prevent the continued uh, degradation of this uh, biodiversity and uh, associated ecosystem services. It's a, re it's a reason why, for example, Rwanda has recently articulated the, uh, of the most recent uh, national declaration uh, on uh, our own contribution, the NDC, to the Paris Declaration, taking on board some very ambitious programs that are going to contribute to the global efforts, but particularly uh, being implemented here locally. And moderator, you just rightly pointed out the efforts that we have put into the natural capital accounting, which we have uh, completed with the support of the World Bank uh, program uh, that you rightly mentioned. And the focus was on four areas which was to uh, carry out an inventory and accounting system of uh, uh, natural capital, particularly land, water, forestry, and natural resources, particularly minerals. This exercise was very, very eye-opening uh, for a number of reasons uh, that many uh, participants have already pointed out in the previous presentations, that the collective value of the natural uh, capital assets that we have tends to be higher than the exploited resources that come out of it. While this is very compelling case for conservation, it was also revealing in another sense that uh, while we are working on a business model that has got to leverage our natural resources for the development of our nations, sometimes the uh, inefficient methods uh, that are used for the exploitation and leveraging of these resources tends to provide the value that is far less than the collective uh, natural capital if left intact and to its own. And what this brought out to us, Rafa, is that uh, for countries to make good use of this natural capital accounting system, there is the big role of technology transfer, a big role of knowledge transfer for the improvement of the methods that are used, the production methods are, uh, in that sense, uh, that are used for the economic activities of, uh, of this country, or of any country, uh, let me say. When that is not the case, then the exploitation methods tend to be very inefficient and yet seem to be necessary, which leaves a country at a loss in terms of the utilization of their endowments. I have to say that despite all this, Rwanda has also taken on uh, an approach of implementing a low carbon growth strategy, noting the fact that we have got a role to play as an individual country in the contribution to the global efforts to uh, make, make sure that uh, global uh, biodiversity and associated ecosystem are uh, not only uh, preserved, but also uh, restored. We have also witnessed some efforts that are done by local communities, and sometimes the most effective efforts are done locally. For example, when we were faced with the continued degradation of uh, uh, our, our uh, national parks, especially in the habitat for the mountain gorillas, it was the community uh, in northern Rwanda, which came together and created 
uh, an association they call the Sabino Community Livelihood Association or SACOLA, which was created in 2004 with two distinct but uh, complementary objectives. One was to see how as a community they can improve their own livelihood by promoting income generation activities around the national park, uh, known as the Volcano National Park, the habitat for the mountain gorillas. On the other hand, they wanted to see how they could contribute to the protection of the national park and the conservation efforts for the, uh, for the mountain gorillas and ensure that they are a solution rather than a problem where previously they had been exploiting the forests, particularly poaching on the animals. They were supported by the government. They were given opportunities for employment, but also government made a commitment to share revenue that comes out of tourism that is a major income uh, from the tourists that go to visit the mountain gorillas. Now 10% of all the revenue from the mountain gorilla tourism efforts goes to that community. Two things have happened. One, their objective for income generation has been achieved uh, as they have seen many of, many of them participating in tour operations and therefore raising their incomes, but also shared directly on the grants coming from the tourism and conservation uh, agency of the country. And now they have become major stakeholders in conservation, which has contributed to not only uh, keeping the mountain gorillas safe, but seeing their numbers continue to grow. This is being replicated now in the mining sector where we are implementing a green mining approach by using local artisanal miners who previously, uh, many of whom previously uh, were illegal miners in artisanal, in artisanal nature to begin to see that when they contribute and participate in conservation efforts, there can also be direct benefit to them, which in this case is the 10% transfer of all royalty benefits from minerals going to the mining communities. And so what I'm saying is that uh, there is an effort that national governments have got to put in place to translate the conservation efforts into direct benefits to the world, social well-being of the population by putting in place measures that uh, promote a, an economic model of inclusive growth, but also uh, that promotes shared value in the benefits of alternative economic well-being that comes as a result of conservation. And so today, uh, Rwanda continues on a journey of implementing the in inclusive uh, economic growth development, but also uh, in, uh, um, implementing a social well-being and citizen-centered development approach. We have seen this not only increase the, uh, the awareness of the population for biodiversity and conservation, but in general, uh, bringing the communities as stakeholders in restoring uh, previously damaged environments. I'll give you an example uh, in Rwanda, if anybody came to Kigali today, as many of you may soon do, uh, you begin to see some of the areas that were previously industrial areas in lowlands that were uh, marshlands or, or, or waterways that now have been uh, restored as natural areas, natural habitats for purposes of restoring the natural waterways. This comes at a high cost, particularly to compensate the property owners and also to reclaim some of these areas. But it's a cost that we think government have got to undertake in order to make a contribution uh, to this effort. Let me conclude uh, by highlighting uh, that while governments at the national level can take unilateral efforts because they see these efforts, in the end, uh, national efforts alone cannot be uh, sufficient. We have got to continue to do regional collaboration as we are doing in the transboundary areas around the Volcano National Park, which is shared uh, between Uganda, Rwanda, and, and DRC Congo, uh, because any effort that is not complemented by regional efforts then becomes a cost, a direct cost, given the fact 
that sometimes there is a short-term conflict between economic gains and long-term benefits uh, from biodiversity and, and conservation. I want to say that Rwanda has demonstrated the commitment to continue uh, to play a role in contributing to this biodiversity uh, conservation, despite often uh, competing uh, objectives, let me say, uh, but we focus on the fact that where we see challenges, sometimes there are also opportunities. And responding to the opportunities and challenges uh, linked to biodiversity uh, requires collaborative efforts ac uh, across government and, and other stakeholders, particularly local communities and private sector operators. In general, therefore, this can only be enhanced uh, through uh, national level regular updating of biodiversity strategies and participating in regional and global efforts so that everything that we do is complemented and augmented by collaborative efforts by, by others. Let me conclude uh, by thanking you once again for giving us the opportunity to share Rwanda's story and for me in particular uh, to participate on behalf of my other colleagues in government. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Um, great to hear you speak there about um, both local action in Rwanda and also the regional dimension. Um, as you say, both really important and we need leadership at all levels. I was particularly struck by your comment there about um, how a focus on livelihoods can simultaneously deliver positive outcomes for nature and for communities. And that's certainly something um, that we want to think about in, in the review. So thank you. Um, if I may turn now to um, the Honourable Kemi Badenoch, um, the Exchequer Secretary to the UK Treasury. Um, thank you for joining us today and for your continued support to the review. Um, the UK recently announced funding for several initiatives to support a green recovery and I wonder if I could invite you to say a few words about those and share your perspectives more broadly on the economics of biodiversity. Uh, many people have said to me that Treasury's commissioning of the review shows significant leadership already on these issues. Um, so if I could hand over to you, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a huge pleasure to be joining you all today as the Minister representing the UK Treasury. As a global review, Professor Dasgupta and his team are keenly aware of the importance of ensuring the review benefits from a wide range of experiences, perspectives and expertise. And so thank you to our panellists and all of you who have participated today. I'd also like to thank uh, Kenya's National Treasury and the Stockholm Environment Institute for convening today's dialogue and the support given by the African Development Bank. This collaboration builds on the UK and Kenya's existing cooperation on climate and environment issues. Uh, this includes our work to protect and enhance Kenya's natural capital through the Forest 2020 project which aims to help protect and restore forests by improving forest monitoring through the use of satellite data and of course the Kenya UK strategic partnership which was launched by President Kenyatta and Prime Minister Boris Johnson earlier this year and it places climate and the environment at the center of our joint efforts. It will come as no surprise that the UK government's focus, as with many governments around the world, is addressing the devastating impact of COVID-19 and restoring our way of life. But the last few months have also brought into sharp focus the strong links between the health of our environment and the long-term health of our economy and society. As my colleague and COP26 president Alok Sharma has made clear, we all share one life-giving but fragile planet and we all share an interconnected global economy. And that's why the Dasgupta Review on the Economics of Biodiversity remains an important priority for us. In my lifetime, populations of animals on average have more than halved. Around a million species now face extinction, many within decades. And it comes as no surprise that for the first time ever, environmental risks now fill the top five places of the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report. Governments everywhere are currently designing um, their economic recovery packages 
in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the UK, our Prime Minister has committed to build back better and build back greener. For example, two weeks ago, the Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that £2 billion will be provided to support homeowners and landlords to make their homes more energy efficient. This funding could support over 100,000 green jobs. And through our international climate finance, which we've committed to doubling up to £11.6 billion, we've established a Green Recovery Challenge Fund to support countries to design their recovery packages in a way that supports a green and resilient recovery. And through our joint leadership of the Recovering Better for Sustainability Workstream under the UN Secretary General's Financing for Development Initiative, we will set out plans to enhance international cooperation to ensure a Paris and Sustainable Development Goals aligned recovery. A green and resilient recovery will also be at the heart of our COP26 presidency, including the conservation and restoration of ecosystems through nature-based solutions to climate change, which could provide a third of the mitigation action needed over the next decade. These are global problems, but with very real and devastating local impacts, we all have a stake in collectively finding and implementing the solutions. And so thank you all once again for today's discussion. It's been very interesting listening to you and also reading uh, the many comments in the chat bar. It's given me a lot of food for thought and lots to discuss um, in the future and at future panels for the Disgib to review. And I hope it provides a platform for future collaboration following the publication of the review in the autumn. So thank you all, and thank you again, Sandy, for giving me the opportunity to address everyone this afternoon. Great, thank you so much, Minister. Sorry, there's a slight delay um, in, uh, in unmuting, so. Um, so thank you uh, so much for sharing your insights there. Again, I was struck by your messages on the global local relationship uh, and on the link between action on environment and the creation of jobs. Um, we certainly look forward um, uh, to your continued support um, as we finalise the review and thank you again for joining us today. Um, so I'm told that unfortunately Ambassador Yatani has been delayed, so instead I'm going to ask Dr. Julius uh, Muya if he would speak on um, uh, the Ambassador's behalf. Uh, Dr. Muya, it's an honour to have you uh, join us here today and thank you also to the Kenyan Treasury support in hosting uh, today's dialogue. Um, Kenny's been a leader in innovative approaches to green finance, including facilitating of course East Africa's first green bond last year year so we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say thank you hi good afternoon everyone i hope uh, i can be heard well sandy thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, i'm speaking on behalf of my minister who has had uh, to rush uh, somewhere for some uh, meeting and uh, I want to appreciate uh, Honorable uh, Kemi, I've just uh, listened to you, and the Honorable Francis uh, Gattari. Earlier on, of course, uh, I had the um, a single uh, privilege of uh, participating as a panelist and listening to uh, Professor Das Gupta. And so really mine, on behalf of my minister, is to appreciate uh, everyone. And um, also uh, say, listening in on this, um, review on economics of diversity. It is uh, generating a very in-depth debate on um, advancing understanding of, of very key uh, issues uh, regarding the role of biodiversity in the economic development and, and especially in our region and in Africa as a whole, where we should be looking for uh, inclusive, resilient, and uh, sustainable development. And so really, uh, at the outset, I want to thank the UK government uh, in commissioning this uh, report, uh, which to me, I think it is uh, groundbreaking in terms of uh, what is being shared now. And um, well, we are excited actually to see um, a very unique link being made between economics, uh, between livelihoods, well-being and nature, which uh, in the past has not been the case. So uh, very well done. And so for us uh, in Kenya, one of the things that uh, we've been pushing through is uh, the area of uh, climate change, uh, where we did a study some times back, 
And um, that study did inform a lot of the works that uh, we've been doing. Uh, because again, uh, Kenya has been affected in the past by related shocks and disasters, uh, such as um, uh, droughts, uh, floods, uh, massive um, destruction and infrastructure, uh, relocations, among others. And so uh, we expect that the findings from um, uh, studies like this and the studies that we did earlier on uh, will help in uh, shaping the current policy and uh, our programmatic actions, both in Kenya and in the continent uh, as a whole. Well, we all know that um, human beings uh, do rely a lot on nature and uh, based on what uh, a professor has shared, this is actually a fact uh, about the food, the water we get, the shelter, the opportunities for recreation and many other fulfillment that uh, we derived from nature. And so we also know nature and uh, from what has been shared about the Amazon and many other places does play a big role in regulating uh, things like climate, uh, controlling diseases, and also man uh, maintaining some other cycles that uh, sometimes we take for granted. And so for us really is to appreciate that uh, without nature, really, you wouldn't have life. And uh, if you don't have life, you don't have any economics to talk about. And so really, given the challenge that uh, we are all facing of this COVID situation, I think uh, we are being drawn to realize and recognize again the role that nature plays as we look at um, our livelihoods and how to improve uh, our lives. It is therefore important um, as we engage in this, and especially for the finance ministers who are involved here, uh, to understand uh, the key uh, role that uh, biodiversity can play in the provision of services uh, that uh, we receive from nature. And here we are looking at uh, what we call the nature-based solutions and the ecosystems that uh, sometimes uh, uh, normal economics does not uh, quantify. And so the whole area of uh, looking at diversity is, um, as an asset within that nature uh, portfolio is something that uh, to me and um, to us in treasury is exciting uh, because uh, it enables us to think about uh, how we can increase the resilience uh, to shocks and also reduce risks uh, to the services on which we rely. And so really this uh, biodiversity debate that uh, we are considering today should indeed become one of the parameters for our macroeconomic modeling uh, while uh, we calculate our prosperity. I, I didn't want to say GDP, but uh, it's prosperity that perhaps could be a better choice. And so I think the question of uh, how to parameterize uh, the issues that are important uh, is one that uh, we need to spend more time on. And so we also recognize some of the key challenges that uh, are facing us in Africa. Uh, the question about our capacity to explore and come up with comprehensive policy and regulatory mechanisms. Uh, so that we can be able to uh, mainstream biodiversity into the government's work plans, into our budgeting systems, into our medium-term expenditure frameworks, into our uh, medium-term plans. And this is important for us because these are the tools that uh, we currently use in government uh, for planning. And so just looking at the whole area of uh, biodiversity loss, uh, it's, it's an area that uh, to us uh, is interesting uh, to ask ourselves what do we lose by not um, taking care of biodiversity in terms of uh, climate change challenges, the um, losses that uh, we can think about in terms of the deforestation, in terms of um, uh, climate change uh, situations that get worse and worse. So for us, uh, in Kenya, we also do recognize uh, the fact that um, our economy does rely a lot on uh, nature, um, that is agriculture, tourism, energy, and uh, also to a large extent infrastructure. So nature is important for us uh, because it's a major contributor and a platform on which our economy runs. And so looking at ways in which we can minimize and reduce the risks and hazards uh, relating to droughts, relating to storm surges, flooding and sea level rises, and uh, that could be interesting if we could even parameterize these losses and come up with a, a universal and agreed way of accounting uh, for such losses. Uh, we also need uh, to, to ask ourselves a question about um, the losses of biodiversity that um, our uh, 
country and our continent that keeps on getting challenged about. Uh, we know about um, land and seas that we have. And if we tie in innovations, uh, there is a possibility that we could be more resilient, uh, we could make our land and sea uh, more useful in terms of sustainability uh, by reducing pollution and also mitigate um, over exploitation of biological uh, resources. Uh, on the side of the financial services sector, uh, there is a lot that uh, we could also think about in terms of uh, tying in uh, the framework of biodiversity to make sure that as we are raising funds and as we are raising resources in the financing sector, we are able to address uh, things that uh, normal uh, financing models uh, do not uh, address. So in Kenya, of course, we have been uh, engaging a lot on the area of um, uh, green uh, growth. And this is uh, based on our constitution and also a long-term development framework, which we call Vision 2030. We've also uh, have drafted various laws and regulations and policies that are hinged on climate change. And so for us, really, it is to work out uh, with this uh, groundbreaking study how we can build on climate change to come up with the frameworks, uh, policies, and institutional structures, uh, which then can enable us to exploit uh, new opportunities that um, are emerging. Now, if you look at uh, our budget allocations uh, lately, we have also been looking to support uh, the technical ministries that are related to nature, the ministries of environment and forestry, uh, the ministries of tourism and wildlife. And here we've been doing that just to recognize the fact that we need to support ministries uh, that interact uh, with nature to, to enable us to innovate and upscale the support that uh, we have uh, for sectors in, in that region. Obviously, Kenya has been uh, participating in uh, global uh, conventions like the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, where we have committed uh, to this convention uh, to, to tie in and support the initiatives and the objectives of that convention. And we've also been um, very, very clear about um, making sure that we preserve our rich diversity of plants, of animals, aquatic, microbiological micro organisms. Given that uh, Kenya is within the tropics and um, within uh, the country, you can start from the Indian Ocean where you've got a coastal climate and then go through the savanna. We have desert, we've got semi-desert. And in the high mountains, you can also see a climate of a temperate nature. So that which Biodiversity is the one that uh, would be looking uh, to make sure that we preserve and, and get the best uh, out of uh, them. Obviously, uh, dealing with the threats uh, that uh, we see uh, coming on the way of diversity, uh, we have also identified, excuse me, <clears throat> a number of parks and um, nature reserves which have been set aside uh, so that uh, we can preserve biodiversity in those areas. We've got uh, big game parks and uh, all over the country we have uh, identified through spatial planning areas where we say those are for agriculture, those are to be left as forests, those are for urban settlements and so on and so forth. And so um, given then that structure, we've also have uh, come up with institutions that um, address themselves to uh, maintaining and um, uh, preserving that biodiversity. We've got uh, our National Museums of Kenya, we've got our Kenya Forestry Research Institute, and many others that um, are quite a number. And um, basically, I think what I would say for these institutions is that um, we are strengthening them, but again, we need uh, to get more resources uh, so that we can be able to increase their institutional and uh, uh, human capacity. In terms of further actions and priority, uh, we are looking at uh, improving our infrastructure, our human capacity, reviewing and harmonizing our policies in major institutions so that we can preserve uh, biodiversity. And so uh, for us in our ministry, and also uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, uh, we are looking at um, a new way of coding our budget. And uh, we've already actually started this, where in our budgeting system, we have adopted 
a coding system to track the flows and expenditures in respect of climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and this is within our IFMIS uh, framework uh, so that we can be able to, to start piloting the recommendations of uh, the uh, Professor Das Gupta's uh, report. And so moving forward, we want just to reaffirm uh, our deep commitment in Kenya in uh, continuing to support measures which are geared towards the conservation of biodiversity uh, because we recognize this to be a major enabler of uh, our country's development. And so uh, the government is uh, putting a lot of emphasis in, in this area. It is also uh, the case that um, as we are doing this, we would like uh, to appeal and uh, request uh, the UK government and African Development Bank uh, to continue lending uh, support and taking a lead role uh, to collaborate with the African countries to mobilize substantial resources to support the implementation of uh, Professor uh, Das Gupta's uh, recommendation. And this should be also one of the ways in which we should be dealing with this uh, uh, pandemic of uh, COVID. And so really, um, we should be looking then to first track uh, what has been shared uh, in the Das Gupta report uh, from the short term, going to the long term, and coming up with frameworks that can enable us to implement uh, what uh, could be done fairly quickly. Now, in terms of the closing remarks, um, now what I would uh, put here, and this is what the minister would, would uh, I'd say, is that, um, there are some areas where uh, clarity uh, could also be focused. And one of the questions that the minister posed is um, what would be the best way of increasing public uh, finance to catalyze and leverage resources towards enhanced support to biodiversity conservation and sustainable management um, to improve productivity and quality investments in an environment where development finance has been declining. The second item that uh, needs clarity is um, that there's need to develop or review existing laws, regulations, and the policies in order to accelerate investments that promote and protect biodiversity. The third and the, the last one, and indeed not the least, is uh, what are the key capacity needs that are needed to advance the implementation of the recommendations of the DAS Gupta report, especially in Africa. And so in conclusion, uh, we would like to thank the UK government again and um, ministers who have participated, the uh, Development Bank and uh, DAS Gupta team, I listened to them, the Stockholm uh, Environment Institute, and all the participants who have um, been part of this uh, event. And also my colleagues in Treasury and uh, UK uh, for planning and coordinating the hosting of this event, which is showing our commitment uh, in Africa as we are mainstreaming biodiversity to finance uh, the sustainable development goals. So I thank you and I wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Muya. Great to hear your further reflections and also from your minister. Um, as, as you said, I mean, you said um, many helpful things there, but one of the things I was struck by was that there's a key question for us on how to translate what the science is telling us about the loss of nature or what we can see happening on the ground and of course the the framework of the Das Gupta review um, but how we translate all of that into action and you mentioned several policy instruments there regulation but also more broadly uh, economic uh, development plans for the medium term finance and the like and I suspect we're going to need all of them and more um, so very helpful insights thank you so if I may then I'm going to just um, briefly uh, um, uh, offer some some closing remarks I'll then hand over to Peter um, to, to, to end um, I'll keep them very very brief conscious that um, we're a little over time so as I said at the outset um, and in the context of the current pandemic the link between nature our health and our economies has never been clearer um, making this review and its main concepts all the more relevant 
huge thank you again to the Kenya National Treasury, the Stockholm Institute for convening today's dialogue and to the Africa Development Bank who helped uh, make today happen. And of course, thank you to Professor Professor Dasgupta himself for his intellectual leadership on this. Um, we're especially grateful today to the panelists for sharing their diverse range of regional experience and expertise with us. Um, and last not, but not least, thank you to everyone on the call that's participated. Collectively, you provided much food for thought as we work with Professor Dasgupta to finalize the review in the coming weeks. And although we haven't had time to go through all of the questions and comments um, in the chat box today, rest assured we will be taking those away and reflecting on them so thank you we are also looking for good examples and case studies to illustrate the concepts discussed today so if you're someone who's working on a relevant project or you want to share information with us um, about a good example please do so we'll put our email address in the chat box it's also in the interim report um, and finally to echo the message from my minister we very much hope that today has provided a platform for the UK's continued engagement and collaboration with countries in the region to continue to work together and address the issues raised by the review. Let me then hand over back to Peter to, to close today's event. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I can be heard. Yes, thank you very much for this rich interaction which we have been having over the last one and a half hours. But before I, I, I say a few words, I would like to recognize the presence of uh, Professor uh, Ntiba, who is our PS responsible for fisheries and blue economy. This, in no, uh, this indeed shows the Kenyan commitment at the highest level possible, that transiting from the conventional way of doing things or handling our economy is at the center of the government at the policy level. There are also a number of colleagues from the UN uh, bodies and also Africa Commission that have just joined us. And that shows that surely the economics of biodiversity and at this time when we are having a challenge of the new disease in the home and in the continent and in the world is really important. Rich discussion from the technical people, honorable ministers who are the policy direct, uh, policy gives policy direction, gives a clear indication that the African continent is awake, is ready, and gearing to go. And what came out from the professor's presentation, which has dig deeper into the key elements of the economics of biodiversity, which needs us to move, is simply that the local community becomes the centrality of how biodiversity conservation should be uh, uh, undertaken to the next level. Paradigm shifting, all the economic models, policies that are destroying, and the people are ready to move toward the advance. As we are closing today, we only need to remember what Professor said, the biosphere is crying. No life, no economy, no future. And if it is at this time that we need the completion of this report, today, not tomorrow, so that we in Africa, we can start the, the, the work. Kenya is ahead, Kenya is putting its own money, but we need support. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all. The work is just started for the technical people. Civil society organizations have spoken, the private sector have spoken, the science have spoken. It is now our responsibility and the treasuries finance to make this change that we desire now and not tomorrow. Thank you very much. In view of this, I would therefore like to call upon uh, Dr. Philip Posano uh, so that if he has got some announcements to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, every colleagues. Um, I don't have anything else to add except uh, to thank all of you for participating and uh, to let you know that we will get back to you with a, a, a report and proceedings of this event and also in terms of when the final report comes out as to how to follow through with that. Uh, and also to recognize and thank and appreciate the African Development Bank, particularly Dr. Cosmas Ocheng, uh, who is the head of the Natural Resources Center for facilitating uh, this process. Thank you so much and I therefore declare this event uh, concluded.